We talked about bits of nerve signaling when we were dealing with muscles, when we were dealing with uh, conduction of the heart, and when we were dealing with feedback loops and cell transport, even if we didn't quite understand how to bring it all together. So this chapter talks about what's going on at the cell level, the difference in ions inside and outside of the cell. So we have to memorize what needs to stay in and what goes out. And then we discuss a couple different channels, things that allow certain ions to flow out and flow in. Now these ions, if you recall, are charged atoms, charged part or with their, uh, they either have uh, more electrons than their proton or more protons than their electrons. So they have a positive or negative charge. And so with this charge, we can send an electrical signal or an electrical um, pathway from one cell to the next, and that's how cells talk to each other. And so neurons can conduct nerve impulses, which we call action potentials, which are a change in negativity from negative to positive. And that impulse is sent as an electrical wave from one cell to the next. And so with these cells, with the excitability and conductivity, let me rephrase it, I'm sorry. These cells have the ability to become excited, to become excited. They can receive stimuli. And they can conduct that change in charge, essentially, from positive to, to negative. And so there's this electrical fluctuation along the plasma membrane, so along the outside of the cell. Now, all living cells have to maintain a certain amount of ions on the inside. For our cells, you can memorize circle K, like the circle K ranch, because we have to maintain potassium on the inside. Now, the first thing we have to keep in our minds is potassium is always a little bit leaky. There are some leaky potassium channels and it leaks out a little bit. And so because of that, there is always a negative charge on the inside of the cell. We have to maintain that balance through special pumps. We learned about the sodium potassium pump way back in chapter two. And it's gonna play a big role here in this homeostasis, maintaining the correct amount of potassium inside the cell and the correct amount of sodium outside the cell. And it's these changes in these two ions, along with a couple others, calcium and chloride, that allow us to send an impulse, to send an action potential. It's just a change in the amount of ions, which changes the charge. And so inside of the cell, if we maintain it at that, if we maintain potassium on the inside, on the outside, we have more sodium. We're always pumping sodium out. And so on the outside of the cell, there's more of a positive charge. On the inside of the cell, because potassium is always leaky, there's more of a negative charge because we're always losing a positive ion. So there are more cations outside the cell or more positive ions outside than inside. And so we have to maintain potassium on the inside and there's always a certain amount of negative charge on the inside. This difference between outside and inside the membrane is called the membrane potential. It's potential stored energy, the potential to conduct an impulse. We can set a signal in place. We can set an impulse by changing this polarity. And so we can change by flooding it with ions. We can set off a change from negative to positive, like a domino effect. And so we're going to learn in the next couple of slides how that happens. But to get the cell back to the negative or back to that homeostasis, we always have to pump some potassium out or potassium back in and sodium out. And so by flooding the cells through some of these channels with sodium, we can conduct that nerve impulse. And so here's a picture to kind of show you that if we were to measure our membrane potential, if we were to measure the charge outside the cell and inside the cell, and if you take Chem 2, you'll do this, you'll look at the positive charge around the outside, negative charge on the inside, that difference is called potential, or membrane potential.
the inside of your cells are maintained at a certain negative charge. For our neurons, we're going to learn that it's negative 70 millivolts, but we have to maintain that difference to get us back to homeostasis because the difference is what allows us to set that impulse in motion. And so the difference in electrical charge between outside and inside is called the membrane potential, and it's essentially stored energy. Energy that we can set in motion. And so your membranes are polarized, they have a charge. And so when we say they're excitable, it means they can receive a stimulus and we can change that charge. When we say they have conductivity, it means we can conduct that charge along the plasma membrane. So typically, and every, there are all different kinds of cells, but typically when we're talking about a neuron, they are kept at negative 70 millivolts. And so the inside of the cell is kept at that negative charge. And so for us to set in motion the action potential, we have to raise that charge closer and closer to zero. It's not an all or nothing response. We have to get to a certain level to set off the whole, the whole situation. But typically, resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. So in order for us to maintain that, we have some channels that are leaky. We said potassium is always leaking out to help maintain that negative charge. We're always pumping some potassium in, Chloride is moving in, sodium is being pumped out. And so there are various channels and various pores that allow us to keep that ion homeostasis to keep that charge at negative 70. Or to bring it back to negative 70 would be a better way to say that. And so gated channels allow specific molecules to cross only when their membrane is open. So along with your sodium potassium pump, which we'll talk about, and the leaky potassium pore, you have special channels that you keep locked up and they only open when you need them. They're called gated, like a gate to get into something. Some are stimulus gated, some are voltage gated. Stimulus means they have to receive the correct stimulus. Voltage gated means they have to receive the right voltage. And whether or not these pores are open or closed allows us to control which ions are moving out in high amounts and which ions are moving in in high amounts. And so we can depolarize or repolarize our membrane and set that action impulse into play. The sodium potassium pump is probably the most uh, important pump in this membrane. We learned about it ages ago, even if we didn't remember it. We're constantly, because potassium is leaking out, we have to pump potassium back in. Sodium is the main stimulus that we send from cell into the cell to start that action potential or to start that membrane potential change. And so sodium floods the cell and that's more positive. So we have to get sodium out. So we pump sodium out and pump potassium in with the same pump. It doesn't do both at once. It pumps potassium in, changes shape, and then pumps sodium out. But there's a difference in amount. We pump two potassium back in and three sodium out. Which again, helps us keep that cell at that negative amount by not pumping in more potassium than we need. And so there are three sodium moved out, two potassium moved in with the sodium potassium pump. So the inside surface becomes slightly negative in respect to the outer surface. And so we have that membrane potential, potential that we can set off if we have to. Are you okay with that so far? This membrane potential difference, positive on the outside, negative on the inside. If we're setting an action impulse, we're just changing from negative to positive. And so here's a picture of the sodium potassium pump, kind of, it's stylized. It doesn't really look like this. It changes shape at one point to pump out sodium. We phosphorylate it with ATP because it's not passive, it requires energy. And it changes shape when we can pump potassium inside. So two in, three sodium out, or two potassium in, three sodium out.
The change in potential can be local. So when we change potential, if we have sodium diffusing in, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing response. And so with sodium in, if we just receive a few sodium, it may just be a small slight change at one particular portion, a local potential. It would have to receive more stimulus in order for us to have enough to travel along that membrane. And so there's a certain amount of sodium we have to receive. And so this is our stimulus to open up some stimulus gated channels. And so if it's a local potential, a slight change, it may not travel all the way to the axon. Remember the axon that's out there with those little synapses talking to the next cell, myelinated. That's just gonna send the signal to the next neuron. But if that membrane, if the potential doesn't make it all the way there, the actual potential, it won't set off. And so we have to receive enough stimulus to get this going. And so we can excite the cell. We can flood it with some sodium. When we flood it with sodium, if it's enough sodium, this triggers the opening of stimulus-gated sodium channels, which means one of these channels up here is just waiting for it to have to be hit with enough sodium, and it opens up to allow even more sodium to flood inside the cell. So at this point, with all of these sodiums floating in, we're moving from negative to positive. We are depolarizing, which we talked about last unit. We just didn't quite know what we were talking about. And so we've gone from that positive to negative. We're depolarizing. And so we're moving from that negative 70 millivolts closer and closer to zero, closer and closer to the positive end. This can trigger our action potential. So if it's enough sodium, imagine it like a domino effect. We can change from negative to positive all the way through until it hits our axon here. And we can add all that stimulus up and decide if we're going to send the electrical impulse to the next cell or not. But we have to receive enough of the stimuli to do it. Go ahead and mute everybody. There we go. They were driving. That was the sound of like the. I don't know if it was. I don't know if it was or not. <laughs> it usually is. What was I saying? Memory potential difference, change in electronegativity, change in charge. We can set that off or not. And so if you look at this voltmeter showing you the voltage, we can depolarize. Now we're also going to talk about how once we set that off, how once we become all positive, we have to get back to the negative. We have to repolarize. So at that point, we'd have to bring some potassium back in. But right now we have depolarization where we're setting off that potential. Now, not every signal sent out is excitable. Sometimes you want to inhibit an impulse. And so inhibition can occur as well, or when you need to bring that cell back to its resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts, you need to open potassium channels so that you can flood out potassium at a higher amount and increase the membrane potential difference. Now you go too far. If you open a potassium channel to let potassium leak out even further, at that point, you kind of go too far. You, you go below negative 70, but you balance back out. So going too far is called hyperpolarization. And that's what this bump is right here, where we've gone below negative 70. But then the sodium potassium pump helps equalize that. We, bump and we bring enough potassium back in, enough sodium out that we equalize it. That's why I said the sodium potassium pump is one of the most important pumps in this homeostasis because it's going the whole time. It's pumping in sodium, it's pumping out potassium. So when we think about this, that, that journey... Now these local potentials are graded because they don't have to be all or nothing. You have to receive enough stimulus in order for it to set off this potential. And so the magnitude of that resting potential is proportional to the magnitude of the stimulus, which is a fancy way of saying 
the more sodium you have flooding in, the more positive you get. And so it's just determined by how much sodium. And this magnitude slows down. And so if you don't keep receiving input of sodium, if you don't keep receiving that stimulus, it may not make it all the way to the axon. And so it's decremental. We can lose speed and we can lose polarity. It will get to a point where it might stop and then we repolarize. And if we don't keep receiving sodium, we don't send that impulse. And so again, with these potential changes, it's not all or nothing at the membrane level. We have to receive enough sodium. And so at this point, let's review what we've talked about. We have to keep potassium inside the cell, circle K. Potassium leaks out, and so we're always a little bit negative. Sodium pumps into the cell to start local potential changes. If we receive enough sodium, we open up a stimulus-gated sodium channel to bring sodium in. Once that membrane potential bounces up, we then open stimulus-gated potassium channels to let potassium flood out. The point of that is going from negative, whoops, to positive. That's the action potential. That's the basics of it. And so if you become enough positive, that can travel and get to the axon. Now we said last time that the axon hillock there can add up impulses. And so if you receive enough, we'll send that signal to the next cell. If you don't, we won't. And so we have to have enough stimulus to get there. And so the magnitude can decrease and if we don't, um, we won't sign it, but if we do, if we do have enough and it adds up here at the axon hillock, we will send that signal. And that's an action potential. And that is all or nothing. This is what we call the nerve impulse. We're signaling one cell to the next. And so if enough stimulus hits here, we will send the electrical charge out to those synapses to either go to the next cell or stimulate uh, a difference. And so if there's enough stimulus, if we receive enough positive, what happens is we go from negative 70 to negative 60, and then we hit negative 59. At negative 59, you have voltage-gated channels, channels that will not open until your membrane potential hits negative 59. At that point, they open and even more sodium flood in. And so that's the point where it becomes all or nothing. So if you get enough sodium into the cell and enough potassium out to get your membrane potential from negative 70 to negative 59, you open voltage-gated channels to let more sodium in. And at that point, there's no stopping it. At that point, you've hit that threshold amount and you're going to send that action potential. You're going to signal the next cell. And so that's what we call the threshold potential. It's the minimum voltage required to trigger an opening of the voltage-gated channel. And so at this point for our cells, we're learning the threshold potential is negative 59 millivolts. That's opening even more channels to allow sodium in. And so at this point, as threshold potential is reached, you have a stimulus-gated sodium channel open. You have a stimulus-gated potassium channel open. Potassium is constantly leaking. And then you open up another voltage-gated sodium channel to allow even more sodium in. Now this voltage-gated, this difference right here when it hits this threshold is open for one millisecond. But it allows just enough sodium inside for you to hit that action potential threshold. And it is all or nothing. Either you got there or you didn't that channel opens or that channel does not. And so when that it opens up, we have sodium rushing into the cell and the membrane moves rapidly toward and continues to zero. And then we hit a point where we have so much sodium that our cell actually hits positive 30. We have completely depolarized. So after you've had enough, you hit that positive 30, we send our, ac our action potential down the axon. After the action potential peaks, we have to be able to send the signal again if we want. And so we now have to worry about getting all the sodium out, bringing some potassium or getting our uh, membrane potential back down to that negative amount. We have to repolarize. 
when we were talking about atrial depolarization and repolarization, this is what we were referring to. We just didn't realize it. And so when we repolarize, the membrane has to move back to negative 70. And so we open some potassium channels, allow more potassium to flow out to bring that lower and lower and lower until we get back to negative 70. So it's all about those ions, all about whether potassium, the positive potassium is leaving or positive sodium is going in. Now there's a point where we have too much potassium leaking out, and so we hyperpolarize. At hyperpolarization, we can't receive any more stimuli. We're extremely hyperpolarized, and so the resting membrane potential is then eventually uh, restored by pumping more potassium back in. And so if you can think of your cell like a battery, on the outside is sodium, inside is potassium. If you flood it with enough sodium, you're going to change from a negative to a positive. You keep flooding in sodium, at the same time you open more potassium channels to leave it out, you completely depolarize. You go from negative 70 to positive 30, and that sends an electrical charge from one cell to the next. That's how your cells talk to each other, or at least the neurons talk to other, other cells and other, uh, like your muscles and things. But you have to get back to homeostasis, you have to get back to negative 70. So at that point, you open some potassium channels, let potassium leak out, and repolarize back to that negative 70 amount. Right after we send an action potential, we're full of positive ions. And so it doesn't matter how much more stimulus we receive or if sodium is flooding in, doesn't matter. We can't send another impulse. This is called the absolute refractory period. It's a brief period, about half a millisecond, right after we've sent an electrical charge, but it doesn't matter how much sodium is flowing in, we can't do anything else. The cell has hit its point where it just can't receive any more stimuli. It's positive completely. Nothing can change back from negative to positive. And so it's called the absolute refractory period. It will not respond to a stimulus no matter how strong. Now, just half a millisecond, that's not very fast at all. Or, I mean, reverse that. That's extremely fast, so I'm saying very quick. And so almost immediately after, if we receive more, then we could potentially send another action potential. So there's also a period right after that called the relative refractory period, which is basically where your cell is tired. It doesn't want to send another action impulse, but if we keep receiving sodium, it will. And so there's absolute where it cannot, and then relative where it will if we keep sending impulses, even though it is difficult. And so this image tries to show you that. It gives the membrane potential over here, shows you negative 70. And so if there's a point where we completely depolarize, get to positive 30, and yes, it probably does make that sound, get to positive 30, at that absolute refractory period, we can't do anything else. But as we're slowly repolarizing, if we receive enough sodium at this point, we could send another action potential. So this picture tries to show you that there is a brief period before we get down to negative 70, that if we receive enough sodium, we can kind of stay in this limbo of never actually getting back to our resting membrane potential, but still triggering more action impulses. And so at this point, your cell would have to be really flooding it with sodium. And so it's a point where the cells don't want to, but they can if they receive enough stimulus, which they can become overstimulated, but that's for another time. And so we want the cell to get back to this white line, this resting potential, where it's no, no stimulus at all. But there's this brief period in between absolute and resting where we could if we received enough stimulus. And so at the peak of our action potential, the plasma membrane's polarity is the reverse of the resting membrane potential. So when we send that electrical impulse, we've gone from a negative to a positive, from negative 70 to positive 30. This reversal in polarity sends an electrical current, just like you're thinking of electricity, how we keep our lights on, an electrical current from one to the next. 
And so the reversal of polarity causes an electrical current to flow between uh, that action potential to the next regions of the membrane, which triggers more voltage-gated sodium channels to open and allows continuous conduction from one to the next, one to the next. And so picture it like a battery. We can set off that in motion. If we receive enough sodium, we can send an action potential all the way down. And if it's enough, it will re reach that axon and be sent to the next cell. And so it will uh, completely depolarize, depolarize, depolarize. And so the dark blue stands for the refractory period where it can't possibly repolarize right now. But we're sending that action potential. Notice it's only going in one direction. So we can only send our action potentials one way. That's because the cell has just gone through that absolute refractory period. So even though the voltage is going technically both ways, the space behind has already completely depolarized. So we can't send the signal the reverse way, it can only go one direction. And so the, the absolute refractory period makes sure that we don't send the signal the wrong way that it goes toward the axon, goes toward the next cell. So the absolute, the action potential never moves backward because of that refractory period. So that would be a good kind of critical thinking test question. Does the action potential move in two directions or just move you know, one direction down the membrane? And that would show me that you know what an action potential is, you know what the refractory period is, and you know that it can only possibly move one way. Now at the myelinated fibers, at the axon, we said that around that, protecting that, is that fatty phospholipid sheath called myelin. But there were gaps called nodes of Ranbir. These gaps allow the electrical impulse to jump. And so it jumps from one to next in what we call saltatory conduction. The word saltatory comes from a word that means jumping. So if you think if you take salt and drop it, how it bounces around. Saltatory is jumping or salticity or the jumping spiders. And so this type of impulse of conduction is called saltatory conduction, and it jumps from node to node. It allows the impulse to be fast. If it had to go all the way down, it would be slower. But when it jumps and jumps and jumps, it can send a quick impulse. Now there's a difference depending on what type of cell we're, or what type of uh, cell we're innervating here, whether we're talking about afferent or efferent. But the fastest fibers innervate skeletal muscle, 300 miles per hour. The slowest are the sensory receptors in your skin, which only move about one mile per hour. That's why sometimes you can, you know, hold your hand over a candle or touch something hot, and it takes us brief second before you realize it. It's not, you know, immediate, where when it comes to thinking about moving a muscle, it happens relatively quickly. Think about how fast you can choose to move, you know, move things versus sensory. So everyone is different, but it's still pretty quick in regards to how other things occur, like digestion. So that was how we can depolarize and send that action potential. I don't know if, I don't remember if I gave you the speech in my welcome or not. I gave the class last night the speech, but I fully understand this is probably the hardest chapter that we have learned or will learn. It's not that the information is difficult or impossible to understand. It will just take you a couple times. You'll, it's definitely something that you'll have to look at. You won't be able to get around just kind of glossing over it. I had to draw it out several times before I understood, for some reason I got caught up because potassium is positive. So it didn't make sense to me that potassium being positive maintained the negative on the inside, but potassium was leaving. So if you think of it as removing a positive ion, but that would make the inside more negative because you're getting rid of negative. So it's always leaking. That's the first one to memorize. Potassium is always leaking. You have to maintain negative quality. From there, you can build up on everything. Talk about sodium being outside, learn what the stimulus gated channels are, learn what a voltage gated channel is, and then think about the whole point is just to go from negative to positive. If you get enough negatives to positive, you can set off that action potential. 
And so that's all it's about. That's nursing. But you will have to spend some time with it. And that's okay. That's the point. I mean, that's how we learn. But don't don't wait until the last minute. Don't wait until May 12th or 13th or whatever the day the exam is. Now, at the end here, at the end of our axons, once we send that action potential, there are two ways that we can talk to the next cell. We can synapse with the next cell. We can either send the electrical impulse directly to the opposite cell in what we call an electrical synapse. And so some cells are joined by gap junctions to allow the actual potential to move right in and begin to depolarize the next cell or to flood it with sodium and depolarize and trigger that voltage gated channel to open. These are how cells like your cardiac muscle cell and your smooth muscle interact with the nervous system. A lot of cells, however, chemical synapse, which means the electrical impulse doesn't directly travel from one cell to the next. At the end of that axon, you open up channels to allow neurotransmitters to leave that cell. And so you have these presynaptic cells before the synapse. I'm gonna to go to a picture really fast. That when they receive that stimulus, they open up the vesicles and little protein substances called neurotransmitters flood across the synaptic cleft and can be received by a postsynaptic cell. So at the end of the axon, you will have the synaptic knob, the cleft where the neurotransmitters can flood across, and then the receivers on the next cell. If we're talking about electrical synapses, the electricity difference is traveling directly from one cell to the next. And so we're helping that to depolarize. Do you remember your intercalated disks in cardiac cell or cardiac muscle, can you picture that the dark bands? Those are the gap junctions that allow the action impulse, the action potential to travel from one to the next. But most of what we're talking about deals with chemical synapses, where there's a tiny gap and we release neurotransmitters across that cleft. And so those types of synapses have what's called a synaptic knob which is the bulge at the end of your axon terminal. That just has, contains vesicles filled with neurotransmitters just waiting to go across that. The cleft, which is the space where the neurotransmitters can diffuse. And then at the postsynaptic neuron, the opposite cell, where those neurotransmitters can be absorbed and taken in. So at the end of this axon, at the synapse, the synapse could be communicating in three different ways. It could be touching the dendrites of a cell. And so when I erase this, so we have our cell body. The very stylized version. You get the idea. And so if we have our cell, our neural cell, the dendrites, the little branches coming off of the cell, there could be an axon communicating directly with that. So we call it axodendritic. The axon could be communicating directly with the cell body. And so we call it axosomatic. Or it could be a situation where an axon is communicating with another axon. And so we call that axoaxonic. And so this picture tries to show you that, that with axodendritic, the axon is communicating with the dendrites of another neuron. Axosomatic, they're communicating with the, directly with the cell body. And axoaxonic, the axons are communicating with the, directly with the axon. So this would be sending an impulse back the other direction. The axoaxonic are usually regulatory, which means they inhibit 
action impulses of the next cell. Because it's not all about sending an impulse to excite another cell. Sometimes the way our nervous system works is by stopping the impulse of some action potential, or stopping the impulse of some cells. And so the plasma membrane of a postsynaptic neuron has protein molecules in it called neurotransmitters that can be released. And that is the signal to the next cell. And so at that synapse, when the action potential jumps, saltatory conduction hits that, releases those neurotransmitters, but right here, you are adding a ton of calcium diffuses into that synaptic knob. The increased calcium concentration triggers the release of even more neurotransmitters by means of exocytosis. So you spit them out. And so those vesicles are just waiting for calcium to hit, to open up and spit out those neurotransmitters. Now you can release thousands of neurotransmitters at a time. We draw with just a few dots, but it could be hundreds or thousands at this point. And you have over 50 different types of neurotransmitters. And so it just depends on what we're trying to communicate. The neurotransmitters could stimulate potassium channels to open, where potassium rushes outward, changing the negativity of that postsynaptic cell, or chloride could move in, changing the negativity of that postsynaptic cell setting off another impulse. This one is underlined and bolded, so I must have asked it as a test question once upon a time. And so when we open the ion channels of that postsynaptic cell, whether we are letting positive potassium leak out or letting negative chloride uh, dump in, what we are doing is setting off a membrane, setting off a difference. It could be excitatory, which means we could be exciting and sending that nerve impulse. They give it a fancy word, but we have to think about what they mean. Excitatory, postsynaptic, which means after the synapse, potential for EPSP, or it could be inhibitory, it could be stopping the cell from sending their impulse. And so it's an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And so we can either be telling the next cell to send its action potential or stopping the next cell from sending its potential. Because think about it, to change the potential, we have to go from negative 70 to well, let me, I'll, I'll have you talk, talk me through this. We said the resting memory potential is negative 70. To send an action potential, we have to depolarize. What charge did our cell become when we begin to depolarize? More positive. Do you know exactly what positive we got when we hit that threshold? Positive 30. And there's a lot that went in in, in the middle. We had channels open, but think about these two. So if we have potassium leaking out, that's allowing this cell to become uh, more negative. If we have potassium or chloride leaking in, that's also allowing it to become more negative. And so whether or not we're leaking potassium, flooding it out, and so if it's leaving, what we're doing here is we are reducing the amount of negativity, so we're allowing the, the positive uh, sodium to take over. If we're flooding it with fluoride, we're bringing it back to that level, and so we're kind of inhibiting this. And so it just is what allows it to either inhibit or excite. Now, once those neurotransmitters are sent out, they can immediately be taken back by this cell. It's called reuptake. They can be broken down and metabolized and recycled, or diffused and taken up by the glial cells. We talked about that last time. With the reuptake, we also talked about how there are some medications called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And so if this is serotonin as an example, if you don't make enough serotonin on your own, you can take a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Zoloft or something, which would stop the reuptake, hoping that you keep enough out there that it can be taken up by the next cell. 
And so some people make enough neurotransmitters, some people don't. But the problem with neurotransmitters is we aren't yet good enough and we don't yet know enough to just give somebody a neurotransmitter. We have all these medications that you can take that help, we think in a lot of cases, but we don't, we don't just give you a neurotransmitter. Maybe someday we can and we can solve all kinds of issues because neurotransmitters are sort of the signals between all of our cells. But unfortunately, we all metabolize and do things differently, and so we don't all have the same amount. And so this is trying to show you that synapse across the membrane. So we have the presynaptic cell releasing those neurotransmitters. It can flood across that synaptic cleft and be taken up by the receptors in the postsynaptic cell. After those neurotransmitters are released, they can be reuptaken, reuptook. What's the, the past tense of reuptake? Reuptooked, reuptaken. They can be reuptaken. Sounds like that doesn't make any sense. We have a reuptake process where they're brought back into the cell. They can be broken down by enzymes or diffused into the glial cells, but regardless, they're removed pretty quickly because you want to wait for the next signal. You don't want them to just rest out there. With this communication between one cell to the next, it doesn't just have to be one-to-one. -one. You can have many different axons communicating with many different cells. And so the, and it all adds up. It's all summative. And so it all adds up to enough stimulus to send an action potential. So the first is called spatial summation, which means you have a lot of axons around the space of another cell. So numerous axons talking to one cell, sending enough impulses to trigger that action potential. It could just be temporal, where it's one axon, but it's sending an impulse over and over and over and over and over again until we depolarize enough to send that action potential. So spatial is a lot of axons talking to one cell. Temporal is the same axon, just communicating over and over and over again, making sure that we depolarize, if, if that is what is necessary. And so summation is just the combination of enough stimuli to set off the action potential. Talking to one particular neuron, you could have excitatory and inhibitory axons. And so if there are more excitatory than inhibitory, you're going to excite and send the, ax or the impulse. If you have more inhibitory than excitatory, you're not. And so that is how your system, your nervous system works, is it's either exciting or inhibiting all the time, making all the different processes occur. And this is occurring in millions and millions of locations all the time. And it's how your brain forms what's called a neural network. All of your neurons and axons of those neurons talking to each other. And it allows us to function as we do as a whole. There are a lot of processes that are just occurring in the background, but it all has to do with whether or not we have enough excitatory axons exciting and sending the action potential, or in some cases, inhibiting. And we interpret that change in electricity I'm not sure to say electronegativity, but changing the electricity, like a signal. Have you heard how computers talk in binary code, zeros and ones, zeros and ones, and it seems insane, that's all it is. It's either turning off something or turning on a signal, but that's all computers do, is just interpret that. Our brains are essentially the same way. They either are reading electrical signals sent or not sent, and they interpret those differences to allow us to do everything. And so if we take that, 
there are a lot of studies being done on memory. There's still a lot about memory that we don't know. There's a lot about our neurons that we don't know, even neurotransmitters. And so a lot of this is hypothesized. It's done on studies on organisms where we excite or inhibit certain neurons or, or cut some away and, and see what happens. But we think that synapses are what play a key role in memory. And so we think that your brain interprets whether or not you're sending a signal or you are sending a signal, kind of like a zero and one of a computer. And you interpret that long code as a memory. You don't have to think about it, you just do it. And so there are different types of memories, however. And so memories we think are stored by facilitating or inhibiting synaptic communication or transmission. And think of it like a zero and a one. Either you are sending the neurotransmitter or you're not. Now, short-term memory, things you're gonna memorize that you know we just talked about in two seconds. We think that that may result from axoaxonic facilitation or inhibition of a presynaptic axon terminal. So a simple going to an axon terminal and either inhibiting or initiating, just one of those terminals. But that won't store for very long because those neurotransmitters will eventually be taken away and that's not a very strong connection. And so we have to be able to store memory in longer ways. And so we have immediate long-term memory, or I'm sorry, intermediate, which is kind of like this class. If you learn something for one week and never think about it again, it may not store as long-term. It will just be intermediate. You can learn it enough for the exam, but then it may not stick with you. That's because what is occurring is you're making special connections, special zeros and ones by using serotonin to block particular neurotransmitter reuptake processes. So serotonin is blocking potassium channels in the presynaptic terminal. And so when serotonin blocks that, it causes a longer action potential. And again, you interpret that, that signal as a longer memory. It triggers the release of more neurotransmitters than usual. That's one of the reasons that memory loss and blocks of time are a major symptom of depression because you're not making a lot of serotonin. And so you're not able to store these intermediate long-term memories. And so while you have short-term, you tend to forget things sometimes, especially if there is a major depressive episode. And it's just because serotonin isn't there to block those potassium channels to make it a zero instead of a one. Or in this case, it would be a one instead of a zero if you're thinking in terms of computers. But now we have long-term memories. So how does that make sense? If we're just interpreting these brief little interactions, zeros and ones, as short-term or intermediate, how do we make long-term? We think that long-term occurs because we build new connections and then we myelinate them and then they're there. And so that they are a process, a new neuron connection that we maintain. And so with long-term memories, we don't just store it as a simple little, whether we're releasing neurotransmitter or not, we're creating a whole new connection just for that memory. And so there are some things, you know, that you can think of from your childhood or, you know, that you thought you'd memorized forever. And it's just because we built that connection. And so that's how you can take short-term memories and turn them into long-term. But here's the thing. You can only do this while you're sleeping. Your brain has to be in a particular state, has to clean itself up essentially and build these neurons while you sleep. And so that's why we say it's so important when you're studying to at least give yourself two nights of sleep because otherwise it's just gonna be short term and you can't memorize long term and you can't really go against this. Like you have to be in that resting state to do it. And so you can't just sort of will yourself to making more neuron connections. You gotta sleep to do it. And that's why sleeping is so important and why you've noticed that those times that you weren't able to sleep, you're pulling those all nighters, you know, working overnight shifts or whatever. You felt like your memory was just, you know, very crappy that whole time because you just, you know, you never sleep in to sort of do that. And so it's extremely important. We're almost done. So at the synaptic cleft, when we're releasing these neurotransmitters, we can classify neurotransmitters by what they do and how they're shaped, whether they are small or large. 
there are more than 50 compounds that are known to be neurotransmitters. Some hormones act as neurotransmitters, some things act as neurotransmitters occasionally, and occasionally act play a different role, like your amino acids. And so the function of what neurotransmitters do are determined by how their uptake, by what the, re, the uh, postsynaptic cell is. And so what that a simpler way of saying that is the same neurotransmitter can be used to stimulate different things. It all depends on what cell is being stimulated. And so looking at chemical structure, we can look at uh, the mechanism by which neurotransmitters cause a change and figure out what they do. So there are four major classes that you have to know, and I think this is the homework question for this. There's acetylcholines, amines, amino acids, and then class four, which we just call other small molecules. It's kind of a cop out, like who named that? Other small molecules. They didn't have a good name for it, so they just said, eh, other stuff, I guess. And there's a fifth called large molecule neurotransmitters, which are our neuropeptides. They're excitatory or inhibitory, and they can be classified by whether they directly open a channel themselves, so open a potassium or chloride channel themselves, or if they're released with a secondary or tertiary hormone, which then go on to do something like G protein coupled receptors, but that's for your endocrine section. So it all depends on what's going on here at the um, synaptic cleft, how they're being taken in. So the neurotransmitter could bind to a site on a particular channel. So in this case, this triangular neurotransmitter looks like it's gonna bind right here. That would open a closed sodium channel. That's gonna allow sodium to flood in. That's gonna change that from positive or from negative to positive. It's gonna start an action potential. So oftentimes these neurotransmitters just open other channels, either calcium, potassium, chloride, sodium, and allow that change to occur. And so it really depends on what type of cell is then being stimulated. So the neurotransmitter itself may not cause a major change, but it can open a channel that can allow that membrane potential to cause the change. One that we've already talked about when we talked about muscles in the heart is acetylcholine. It has a unique chemical structure, uh, acetate, which is acetylcoenzyme A with choline. It's present at various locations. It can be excitatory. One of the chains of your, or the case of your heart, it can be inhibitory. It can be the brakes. Uh, but when we talked about muscle contraction, it was excitatory. It caused your muscles to contract when that was released or caused calcium to flood into the cell, cause contraction. And so choline comes from the diet. Think about acetylcoenzyme A, and if you can answer in, I don't know, 30 seconds, I will let you put five bonus points on whatever exam you want. If you think back to biology or the first unit of this chapter, of this whole semester, where does acetylcoenzyme A come from? People at home, you have even less time because you can Google it and I can't tell. Any guesses? So choline is the diet and acetyl coenzyme A. Somebody last night got it, but she's also in botany, so. Any guesses? Uh, it's one of those hard, we don't like, really, well, this was one of those short-term intermediate memories. Why would we keep this long-term? It comes from the cell respiration when you're during uh, when you're breaking down glucose molecules to get it to go into the mitochondria. You have to bind it to acetylcholine A, and so you you get these processes from the leftovers of uh, cell respiration. That's just more of a a little tidbit there. The second class are called amines, like dope amine. They're synthesized from amino acids, and there are two categories, monoamines and catecholamines, which if you've ever worked in a pharmacy or worked on medicine, you maybe have seen monoamines and catecholamines. Monoamines can be used as mood stabilizers. 
Now remember, we can't just give dopamine. We have to give monoamine inhibitors or reuptake, whatever. But dopamine has an inhibitory effect on certain somatic motor pathways, makes you slower. While things like epinephrine and norepinephrine make you more excited. So things like epinephrine and norepinephrine make you stressed or anxious or angry. Dopamine calms you down, makes you chill out. And so your amines help stabilize your mood. Now they aren't really for mood, they're used for your fight or flight to keep you alive right, whether you're running or not, you know, getting out of there or we're calming down. But because we're social creatures and they affect our brain, they also affect our mood, whether we are irritable or happy or... The third are amino acids, just like we learned when we were talking about how you can take amino acids and build up a protein, like you learned in biology and intro chem. These same amino acids can be reutilized as a neurotransmitter. In fact, we think of the most common in the central nervous system because they're already up there. So in the peripheral nervous system, they are stored in vessels just like neurotransmitters to be used. So things like glutamate and lysine are uh, effectively neurotransmitters. And so, no, never mind. And the fourth, other small molecule transmitters, for this class, just memorize nitric oxide as the other small molecule. It's derived from an amino acid. Um, it's written as NO, nitrogen and oxygen. It provides a feedback in the neural pathway. And so it, it allows the cells, uh, the neurons to know um, sort of what's going on. But again, don't think of it as in the cell itself. I shouldn't use those teleologic terms, like the cell wants or the cell knows. It's not the cell knows what's going on. It's that it's triggering a signal or it's not triggering a signal. And we just recognize that. I tend to do that a lot. Like the cell wants to do that. Well, it doesn't really want to do that, but. No, no. Finally, with the large molecule, we're just gonna stick with neuropeptides. The neuropeptides are just short strands of amino acids, so a bunch together, called polypeptides, or a bunch of amino acids, pepti peptide bonded together. They were first discovered in the digestive tract to have a regulatory role. I think we talked a little bit, maybe in this class, or maybe it was the other class, about how your digestive system is the, kind of like the second brain, because a lot of neurotransmitters that are released in the digestive tract also affect your brain in similar ways, like serotonin and neuropeptides. They act as neurotransmitters in the brain and can be secreted alone or with a second or third neurotransmitter. They have to have a partner sometimes. They can't just act on their own. They're released in, in packets of two or three. But you'll get more of that in the endocrine chapter. And so neurotrophins are a type of neuropeptide. We can release neurotrophins. They are neurotrophic, which means growth or energy level. And so what that means is neurotrophins, if we release it, it can cause new neurons to grow. And so they reach toward that neurotrophin. They're stimulated to grow towards the neurotrophin. We can also inhibit neurotrophin, remove neurotrophin, and those neurons are going to degrade. So we can cut back neurons as well. Our brains, especially when we're growing up and we're uh, going from that child to adult stage, but even now, you can lose neurons and gain neurons. And so your brain is extremely malleable. You can always learn new things or you can always forget things too depending on how strong the memory was. And so neurotrophins play a role in either cell growth toward the neurotrophin or degeneration if we're removing neurotrophins. As I, as I teach, up here throughout the semester, I've been getting 
this class lesson, so I always like pay attention sometimes <laughs> while I'm talking, like, what's that all about? But anyway, they probably do the same thing. Uh, when we're talking about the nervous system, we are learning more and more and more. This was the decade of the brain. They called it, you know, we we're supposed to be studying nothing about but the brain. Uh, previously, the 1900s, we thought that when you're studying the nervous system, you should look at one particular neuron. And any fault in that system was due to a particular neuron. But there was also a developing reticular theory, which that just means network. It meant that the whole system itself is one big network, and you can't rely on just learning one particular type of neuron. You have to learn about the whole system. Well, just like pretty much everything in science or everything in the world, really, is more of a mix of those. The nervous system is a network of interacting neurons, but individual neurons can play a significant role in functionality. And so the neuron doctrine has kind of been expanded to include concepts of both. So we know that neurons are distinct units, but they do work as a whole, as a, as a as more of a network, just like a computer system. And so the neurons connected by synapses and some signals can actually move in two directions. There are some neurons that can send signal um, to another cell, more than one cell, I'm sorry. And so because neuroglia also participate in the neural network, which is a, a new discovery, the whole concept of the nervous system um, is expanding because we know now that it's not just neurons on its own, but the glial cells that hang out around those neurons. And so when we have, if we could look at this nice stylized image, these are all these neurons axons and neurons connecting with one another, colorized with a computer. But our neural network itself develops early in life, and then we weed out the stuff we don't need and build important major pathways. But you can grow new connections. And so as you learn new experiences, especially as a child, but you can definitely grow new, new uh, connections. And those axons are supported by the amount of available neurotrophin. And there are a lot of mechanisms for allowing neurotrophins and not releasing neurotrophins, and sleep is one of them. But there's a lot that we don't understand, but there's hope that we could eventually figure it out and then potentially begin to help people regrow neurons. And so if there is another nerve damage, maybe there's a way in the future we can remove those astroglial scars or astrocyte scars and then use neurotrophins to help regrow. So who knows what the future is going to hold with that, but it, it really comes down to the neurotrophins. And so just basics really fast, when it comes to those axon connections, when we're talking about uh, different types of talking here between the two cells, different types of communication, it could be a convergent event where there are a lot of individual axons all talking to one type of cell, like a motor cell, a muscle cell. Or it could be divergent, where you have a particular impulse heading to multiple other axons, multiple other neurons. So convergent, many to one, divergent, one to many. And then we always end with disorders. So if we're talking about nerve condition, how your nerves are functioning, most of those disorders involve myelin because myelin is necessary for the saltatory conduction. And there are a lot of disorders that affect this. Uh, MS, multiple sclerosis, um, develops lesions or scars on this myelin sheath. And so you can lose muscle control, memory, um, Alzheimer's, you can, you know, or dementia can affect memory you know, you can lose those memories, lose those connections. Parkinson's develop issues, so you begin to lose motor control. And so shakier, or, you know, you, you eventually lose function of your body. There can also be cerebral vascular accidents, which you'll probably hear these again if you go in the medical field. These are strokes, cerebral vascular accidents, issues where there's been a blood clot or low blood flow. And then issues with synapses occur with autism and myasthenia gravis. 
And so with uh, strokes or CVAs, they call them, cerebrovascular accidents, and many strokes or transient ischemic attacks, you've had either a blockage or low blood flow causing that tissue to become hypoxic, low oxygen, and hypoglycemic, low sugar. And so there can be cell death at that point. And so we know that if it's nerve damage in the periphery, that might regrow. But if it's nerve damage in the brain, it's flooded with astrocytes and it scars and it may not regrow. And so it's always hit or miss if someone has a major stroke or a mini stroke, whether or not they are going to retain that ability or not. It's one of those types of things where time will tell. Now with myasthenia gravis, this is an autoimmune disorder that you may come across. It's where your acetylcholine receptor sites, your body recognizes it as being foreign. And so you attack those receptor sites. And so because you have to have acetylcholine to release calcium for muscle contraction, with myasthenia gravis at that point, um, you can't move your muscles. So these people begin to have droopy faces, droopy arms, and then eventually they can't move their body because there's no receptors, you have no response. You can't get your muscles to contract no matter how much you want to. And there's a lot we don't understand with autism, but we think that it could perhaps be a situation where there is uh, differences in synaptic response. So anyway, that's that for this whole chapter. I know it's hard, but you're gonna feel so smart by the time you get it, so smart. Today, we are doing everything else below the diaphragm. So whenever you get upstairs, um, get your cat out, and we're going to look below the diaphragm, all the rest of the organs. And before you leave today, you will have to point out everything. <laughs>